Good morning. It's great to see you all. And for those online, thanks for joining us. I'm not sure what time of the day it is for you, but we're glad that you're with us. Um, traditions are a very important part of life. In fact, in a way, you can say it's kind of the memory of a culture. A culture that has no traditions kind of has a form of dementia. There's things it doesn't know about itself. The question becomes, uh, in what time does traditions become a helpful thing and what times does it become a harmful thing? And Jesus actually weighs in on this. And that's the passage we're going to look at as we continue in our study on Matthew. Where Matthew chapter 15, it says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash with their hands before they eat. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law come from Jerusalem. Jesus is not in Jerusalem. Jesus' ministry has gained a lot of popularity, and as a result, there, he's been heard about in Jerusalem, and because of the massive crowds that are following him, and the incredible stories of the things that he says and does, they're coming basically to test him, to observe, uh, to see if there's something credible or incredible about this man. And so, uh, so they come with a, 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 at least some suspicion about him. And of all the things that they could have asked Jesus about, the thing that they focused on was that his disciples did not wash their hands the way the tradition of the elders required them to. And this was a tradition of the Pharisees. And, and so it's very easy to focus on a tradition and their their approach and their questions, and to assume that this is just a bad thing. But the original goal of tradition is actually to honor Scripture. There are, there are places in Scripture that uh, talked about hand-washing, not so much for, um, for ordinary people, but for priests, and I'll get to that in a minute. But even uh, one of the Psalms talks about this. Who, who can approach God? He who has clean hands, right? So they wanted to kind of represent that. And before they would eat, it wasn't just a sanitary thing for them. It was, well, kind of like the way uh, some of us ask blessings on meals before we eat. And so it was a way for them to reflect that. Uh, and the traditions were de developed so that they could understand Scripture and apply it to their life. They didn't just want to think thoughts, they wanted to live out its truth. And in the Old Testament, there were some regulations for the priests about hand washing, but it wasn't intended for everyone. But this is what the Pharisees thought. They said, wouldn't it be great if we actually elevated our spiritual life to be that of priests? Like, wouldn't that be a good thing? And before we're too critical of it, we should actually remember that in the Reformation of Christianity, one of the highlight focuses was the priesthood of all believers, right? That each and every one of us are capable of two things. One is approaching God on our own, and secondly, being a resource of blessing to other people. And so we begin to apply that reality to our lives, but we can also start developing this idea that whatever the standards or requirements of the, the priesthood is, that that is now imposed on everyone. So the religious leaders actually did not accuse Jesus of not washing his hands. They said, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. This is interesting to me because what it shows is that Jesus was washing his hands, but he was doing it in a way that didn't feel like an imposition to other people. That's a really unusual way to approach how we live out our faith. And uh, why don't you make other people do what you do? Because this is how traditions get developed in spiritual environments. They wanted their actions of everyday life to be kind of a doctrinal statement. And so you need to do this. It's the tradition of our elders. And Jesus' response is very surprising. I mean, at first it looks like he's having a bad day. Has anybody had a bad day before? Is anyone having not one now? Is anyone gonna have a, one if I ask you to raise your hand again? Okay. Jesus replied, 
Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. <laughs> it's a really stark response, and I'm sure they were not prepared for it. Uh, Jesus taught that scripture is more important than tradition. It's an important thing to remember. And what he basically says is, why are you focusing on whether my, my disciples wash their hands when you are in fact parent abusers? That's the impact of that statement. In what way were they parent abusers? Well, there's a concept in scripture in the Old Testament that, that when you make a vow, you're supposed to keep it and the most sacred vow you can make is to God. And no matter what, you keep that even if it's to your own harm. And there was a practice that was developed. There was a word that you would use and the word was korban. And if you said that word, that meant whatever that resource was, you were devoting to God, which means that nobody else could have access to it. And so what would happen is that there would be resources that were intended to be devoted for the care of parents, and an adult child would just say, Corban, and that meant their parents had no access to that resource. And here's an interesting little nuance about it. It meant it could only be used for God, but it didn't have to immediately be given to God which means that if it was money or if it was property or if it was some other tangible material thing, they could hang on for a while and benefit from it, but they wouldn't transfer it to help their parents in their situation because they had promised it to God. And, and, and we go, well, that, that seems a little odd, but think about it. There is a logic behind it, right? Isn't the spiritual more important than the natural? And isn't the divine more important than human? And isn't God more important than parents? I mean, if you know much about the teachings of Jesus, there's actually a point where he tells his disciples that they need to prioritize him over their own family. So how is this any different? And the difference is, is that in the Bible and the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, the fifth commandment was to honor your father and your mother. The first commandment is to make sure there's no other gods before God. Only he can be God in our lives. And what Jesus reminds his disciples is when you put God first, you are actually able to keep the other commandments. When you put God first, you can actually be a better spouse, a better parent, a better child, a better sibling, a better neighbor. So that, that they, were, they were basically nullifying the fifth commandment. And, uh, and this is what uh, the, the early church understood this. And the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to a young pastor named Timothy, he talked about this. This is what he says in 1 Timothy 5. He says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The church kind of understood what the the appropriate things were and to, and to allow a tradition to be the reason why you couldn't take care of family they understood that was not appropriate. Now, whenever I talk about this, I have to acknowledge that this is not a call to subsidize unhealthy or destructive behavior. You know, if you have a relative who, who uh, goes out and gambles every resource they lay their hands on, you're not obligated to keep giving them money. If, if you have someone who struggles with compulsion and they use that to bring destruction to their own life, you're not obligated to give them money. The point is not that you have to give to family no matter what they ask, no matter what the need. The point is, is that we want to honor our parents, we want to honor and take care of our family, and we shouldn't use religious excuses for avoiding that responsibility. So how do these commandments come to be? It hurts God when we hurt others, and that's why God's commands exist. The commands of God are there so that we will treat others with dignity and respect, because without those commands, we tend to treat others without dignity and without 
respect. So, <laughs> so you can imagine, right? People are not that much different. Technology has changed a lot, but people are a lot the same. So don't even give a knowing glance right now. Just put your best poker face on, and stare straight ahead and give nothing away. Put on sunglasses if you need to right now. But have you ever been frustrated with your parent and then said something in response to them? And that, that, what that was happening and in a moment of a heated exchange, the adult child would just go, Corbin! And whatever was owed the parent isn't going to come to them now. And interestingly enough, even if they said that out of a moment of frustration, the rabbis of that day would not allow you to recant the vow because that was a vow to God. It didn't matter what motivated it. It didn't matter if you wish you hadn't said it. All that mattered is that you did. And so they had to, to pay that out. And as I said, it wasn't always immediate, but that resource eventually had to go to the purpose of God. Now, when we hear something like this, it's really easy to get frustrated with very religious people who seem to have very strict regulations. And, and, but we have to remember that often the original goal of what it is that they're doing was to honor God, to honor his word. But here's the point. We're always better off when we are applying the scriptures to our own lives. This is important. We need to exercise caution when we're trying to get other people to comply. Our focus needs to be on how we can apply God's word to us. So Jesus told these religious leaders, that they were prioritizing their traditions over Scripture, and by doing that, they had made Scripture useless, worthless to them. That there were very powerful truths that were being ignored. There were life-giving principles that were being set aside, and people were actually suffering as a result of their traditions. This is what it says uh, going on from here. Jesus says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Now, the word hypocrite kind of has a meaning to us, but the word in Greek actually means an actor. An actor. So I think this weekend is at the Oscars. Is that true? Yeah, all hypocrites. <laughs> By Greek definition, it just means an actor. They, they play another part. To us, what hypocrite usually means is someone who says one thing, but they do something else. They say good things, but they do bad things, right? But for Jesus, his definition was something else. You're playing a part. What it is, is you do good things, but for not good reasons. And, and that definition is a lot more challenging for us. Because we all know if you say one thing and, and do something other than that, like that's not good. But it's really easy to hide when we do good things and we actually have hidden motives for it. We're playing a part, not just in a play on a stage, but in life. And to Jesus, that's what's happening here. So he quotes Isaiah, and he says, there's a lot of distance between your head and your heart. And he says, because of your, your human rules, your traditions, you've actually made your worship useless. It's in vain. Now, the goal of God's commandments is actually to help us treat others with dignity and respect. And when we forget that, our worship becomes worthless. If we are treating others with dignity and respect, it doesn't matter how many people show up in rooms like this. It doesn't matter how loud our voices are. It doesn't matter how high our hands are raised. It doesn't matter how well a service is put together. It doesn't, none of that matters. We, our worship becomes worth less because we are, we're acting out of our traditions, but we're ignoring the heart of God and his commands. So where do traditions come from? They're human opinions about how to live out God's word, how to honor him. But it's so easy to lose focus and make it all about the tradition. So this is not a call 
to give tradition no place. It is a call to keep tradition in its place. There's a difference. We must be careful not to fall into this idea that God is opposed to tradition and therefore we will have no traditions. And the only thing that's worthwhile or counts is if it's new, if it's innovative, if it's something that we just created and, and that's what counts. You can, you can make a tradition out of we don't do anything the way we used to do it. We can make a tradition out, it always has to look different, it always has to be different. That's a tradition too, right? That's how it is. So we must be careful not to make those kinds of traditions. So how are we supposed to properly understand scripture then? How can we live it out in ways that are healthy? How can we develop traditions that are actually about applying God's word and not trying to get other people to comply to make us feel more comfortable? And the answer is, is that we measure everything by Jesus. Because John's gospel tells us that the word of God became flesh. The commands of God became flesh. And so everything that reflects and represents Jesus flows out of the heart of God. But sometimes our traditions don't look or sound very much like Jesus. By the way, when we reflect Jesus, that doesn't mean that everyone automatically likes us or approves of us. That's not the point either. Uh, I promise you right now that, that Jesus is offending the Pharisees, and we're going to read in, a, in just a minute a passage that that's the concern of the disciples. But our job, listen to this, our job when we think about how to live out our life is not to change Jesus so that he fits in better with the people that we like to hang around or to change and impose on people so that we feel better about hanging around them. Our goal is to submit to Jesus. That's the goal. We're not here to change Jesus, and we're not here to change someone else. Let Jesus bring change. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, we often don't realize how much we've been influenced by tradition. Does anybody have like Christmas traditions? Yeah? There's things that you do kind of every year. Uh, in our house, we had a Christmas tradition. It was, it was the lighting of the tree. And uh, somewhere along the line, I don't know where, actually I do, I remember the person who taught me this about how to, to light the tree, how you, how you would string the lights on the tree. And, and, and I saw his tree one time and it was just absolutely stunning. It was beautiful. It was, it was so impressive. I said, how do you do that? And he, and he told me how. And so you take a string of lights and you wrap them around every branch and then the branch out and then a branch in and a branch out. And there are just hundreds and hundreds of lights where dozens of lights would have been enough. But I wanted our kids to have this experience of just this tree that had all these lights. And so, so I, and, and their job, their job, they didn't have to stick their hands into the tree and wrap them. All they had to do was to hold the string of lights and, and follow me around the tree. And they hated it. And to this day, they would prefer a naked tree. They didn't like it. My tradition did not work. So then Jesus called the crowd. Now this has been kind of a private conversation. Now he brings the crowd in and says, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So Jesus includes the crowd in the conversation. What is it that defiles a person? And Jesus says, it's what comes out, not what goes in. This is interesting because a lot of the Old Testament has very important information about what's considered acceptable and unacceptable food to eat. Like the, the whole concept of kosher and non-kosher, this was a really big deal. So if you look in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, there's a whole list of things and a bunch of rules. So for example, in that, in that chapter, it tells us not to eat pork. So you're probably not surprised about that. And, and it also says not to eat owls. Or vultures. I'm good with that. Bats, rats, and lizards. How many here have just been tempted lately to eat a lizard? Just <laughs> deep fried lizard. <laughs> so 
When the church began to expand outward and cross over into Gentile regions, the church had to struggle with the issue as to whether they would impose the same dietary restrictions on the new believers who were not Jewish as the Jewish people had. And part of the resource that they considered in their decision were these words of Jesus. And what they came to the conclusion of is that they weren't going to impose those rules on the Gentiles. We cannot practice, and why, why is this? Because what they were doing is that by imposing those rules, they were ruling people out. And here's the thing, we cannot practice the golden rule if we're ruling people out of our lives. We can't treat others as we want to be treated if we keep finding ways to keep them out of our life. Uh, Paul would talk about this and when he wrote to the Galatian church about this whole concept of human rules, and this is what he says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. So if lizard is your thing, go for it. Or regard to religious festival or new moon celebration or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, that's an interesting concept, and the worship of angels, it's a belief in spiritual things, but not making God the most important thing. Don't let those things disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen and are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind, and they have lost connection with the head, that's Christ, from whom the whole body, that's the church, is supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews and grows as God has caused it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Things like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based, listen, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And this is what Paul was getting to, and this is what Jesus was talking about. We can come up with lots of rules. They can be strict, and we can try to impose them, but it, you can change your behavior. It doesn't mean you've changed your heart. And that's what Jesus is always concerned with. So what is he saying? Your diet may make you healthier, but it won't make you more spiritual. I had a person one time who challenged me. I was in a small meeting and, and, and she told me that she was vegan. And I said, well, good for you. And she said, if you're a vegan, you live longer. I said, no, you don't. It just feels longer because you don't get to enjoy anything <laughs> you eat. Um, so who is defiled, ruined by what comes out of your mouth? And it's not just the speaker, it's, it's also the hearer. Toxic and disrespectful words don't just hurt the person who's saying them, they hurt the person we're directing them at. And so we need to be very careful about the kinds of words that come out. So in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus actually tells us that we are going to be held accountable and given account on the day of judgment for every word that comes out of our mouth. We should pay attention to that. Jesus insists that our words matter. This is what comes out. We've all fallen short when it comes to our words. We don't have a perfect record. We haven't said, we haven't always said the right thing in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. And so we have heart issues. See, we think, oh, I need to control something. Oh, there's a heart thing. So it, it goes on and says, then the disciples came to him and asked, don't you know that the Pharisees were offended? They could tell uh, when they heard this. And he replied, every plant that my heavenly father is not planted will be pulled up by the roots. And he said, just leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind leave the blind, both will fall into the pit. And Peter said, explain the parable to us. It's the parable of the mouth. And he says, are you still so dull? Jesus asked them, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? 
But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Jesus is saying if we can't see what's really important, then we're not going to see where we're going. There are holes we keep falling into, and everybody who follows us will fall into them too. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. The Pharisees were deeply offended, and the disciples picked up on that. And Jesus' response is, just let them be. Jesus wasn't there to argue them into submission or to somehow put them down in front of other people. He just said, if you follow people who don't know what's really important, you won't like where you wind up going. And we kind of get that, right? But there's people following us too. Jesus is not going to try to argue us into submission. He just comes and he offers us truth and his love. And there's times when his words aren't going to sit very well with us. And he's not going to stand there and have it out with you. Out of our heart comes things. And what's really interesting is Jesus just referred to the fifth commandment, but all the things that he talks about now after this, about what comes out, are commandments six, seven, eight, and nine. That when our heart's not in the right place, that's amazing what else gets out of place. And he talks through all of this. What he's saying is, our heart doesn't change just by washing our hands. I wish it were that easy. I do. It's so easy to start seeing ourselves as, we're the hand washers. We're the people who worship like this. We're the people who sing these songs. We're the people who come together in these kinds of buildings. We're the people who have these practices. And the great temptation is not just to live them out in ways that draw us closer to God, but to start seeing other people who don't do those things that way as less. And Jesus tells us, don't let your identity be in the practices that you do. Let your identity be in the Creator who loves you and sent a Savior for you. Let that, let that be your identity. How many are grateful we are who He says that we are? Amen? That's who we are. Would you bow your heads this morning? Uh, Father, we come before you today. We have traditions. We have practices. Would you help us not turn those into something that push others away or put others down? Would you help us not just focus on the things that are external? Would you help us bring you into our hearts and our lives in a way that help you become alive to us and that life flows through us? We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.